Early this morning, Egyptian fighter jets took off from Egypt and attacked about a dozen or so targets in the eastern part of Libya. They say they targeted uh, weapons depots, training camps belonging to the Islamist militant group. But this is the first time Egypt is now participating overtly in operations in Libya. But it also marks a turning point for ISIS. It has now declared itself in Libya. As always, it depends on whom you talk to and what their political leaning is. We have been told here on Midpoint by some experts that ISIS is indeed on the run and they are not strong enough nor smart enough to truly go on the offensive in Europe and then perhaps even America. But then we have events such as this weekend and we are forced to confront the fact that ISIS is fooling everybody, including the experts, and the threat is only growing, not diminishing. So let's welcome to Midpoint, senior fellow at the London Center for Policy Research and the former Deputy Undersecretary of Defense, Jed Babin. Jed, thank you so much for being here today. Great to be with you. Jed, here we go, and we've heard this before, but now we have so many conflicting stories. Some people slash experts will say, wait a minute, ISIS getting close to Baghdad, not a big deal. They couldn't overtake it. They are not as strong as we think they are. Then we have others who say, wait just a minute here. They are strong. They do have tentacles in other countries. Matter of fact, Italy today is very concerned, and they want NATO to get involved in going up against ISIS. So, Jed, in your estimation, then, who's got it right when it comes down to how strong ISIS is? Well, I think the truth of the matter is they're a lot stronger than the pessimists uh, in basically saying, that, well, we don't have to worry about them. Uh, you know, I'm more of a pessimist saying we do have to worry about them, and these guys are a big threat. Are they big enough of a threat for NATO to get involved? Maybe. The real point here is the Egyptians and the Jordanians, the Saudis should be at it. The Arab nations have an obligation to do this. This is their fight, not ours, and we should really be relying on them to do it. I'm very happy to see what uh, President al-Sisi is doing. He's responding appropriately. The Jordanian King Abdullah has done uh, quite a bit in terms of airstrikes against ISIS. And these are things we ought to be encouraging and, frankly, helping them do uh, in terms of resupply, intelligence, whatever we can do uh, without getting much involved ourselves. But, Jed, again, it comes down to that one great point. And you are right. So many people will say this is not our war. We are sick and tired of America constantly getting involved overseas someplace. But then again, we look at these other governments that are involved. And frankly, there are people who say Egypt could not do it without us. Jordan could not do it without us. Israel could not do it without us. So aren't we, in effect, just stuck where we are? And there really is no way out if we are intent on keeping this threat confined, or I should put confined in air quotes, to the Middle East? Well, I don't think so. I think they can do it. And they can do it maybe with some help that we don't need to inject American troops. This is their fight. After all, this is part of the Sunni-Shia battle that's going on throughout the Middle East right now. It's not really even Israel's fight. I mean, this is fight is going on in Syria and in Iraq and perhaps spreading its tentacles to other places, certainly Libya. Uh, these are the things that the Arab countries ought to be taking care of themselves. Look, we have gone on since probably World War II uh, and basically given them our protection. They have always allowed us, not really allowed us, they've always wanted us uh, to fight their wars for them, uh, let the gringo turistas do it. But this is their fight. This is not our fight. You know, if it gets to the point where ISIS is strong enough to strike in America, maybe they're going to have adherence here. They probably already do. But that's not an existential threat to the United States. It's not a vital national security interest to take these guys out. Has that, that's the only circumstance where we should be going in. Has that, i got about a minute left before we take a break, but has that not already been proven wrong when you look at the pullout already, basically the drawdown of troops there? We left, we left a country broken. It has been a disaster ever since. So there are people say, Jed, you're right, we don't want to go in. But when we do get out, then it becomes a disaster. We're stuck right back in it again. It's a but vicious circle. Point. You, it's not really a vicious circle. We have to break the circle. This is a situation which we, you know, we could stay in Iraq for another 60 days or 60 years. Same thing in Afghanistan. The same thing is going to happen when we leave, whenever we leave. And the question really is, how do we play a sufficiently large game of whack-a-mole to make sure that this does not come to our shores? I think we can do that. Do you think, though, it's good that we now have the Italian government is really concerned when ISIS says we're coming to Rome. Granted, anybody makes anything they want. You can spit out anything you want and make a threat. But now Italy is concerned that ISIS might wind, might wind up there. Maybe it's good. Maybe these countries are now finally starting to understand that it's going to come to their door first, maybe, before it comes to ours. 
Well, yes, and the problem you have again is that the NATO nations have not spent, they've not invested in their own defense for 40 or 50 years. So they need to get wise, they need to start rearming, they need to rebuild their armed forces. Again, it's not our job to defend those allies who refuse to defend themselves. That's the point that we have to drive forward with, and I think that's a policy that can make America a lot stronger. All right, Jed, if you would, please stand by just a couple of moments here, because the phrase that the White House would prefer we not use, boots on the ground, it's in play in the Middle East, no matter what we're being officially told, no matter how you try to look past it. And when is a ceasefire not really a ceasefire? It's when Vlad is involved. It's all coming up right here on Midpoint. Welcome back to Midpoint, former Deputy Undersecretary of Defense and currently Senior Fellow at the London Center for Policy Research, Jed Babin. Jed, after our conversation in the last segment, I have a feeling that this won't sit well with you either. And that is the fact that no matter how the president wants to spin it, no matter how anybody wants to say anything, 4,000 soldiers are going from Fort Carson, Colorado to Kuwait, the largest U.S. ground force currently in the Middle East. And oh yeah, by the way, they will have tanks and Bradley fighting vehicles just in case. If this doesn't sound like boots on the ground and getting ready for a new incursion and a new war, nothing does. I agree with that. Uh, but I just don't think it's a very wise move. I mean, boots on the ground is one thing. I mean, we can have a situation where, uh, under the new war authorization, we would have pilots rescued by special forces or otherwise. Obviously, that's the kind of thing we should be doing. But if we're going to be involved further, I just don't see why we would. Again, we come back to the point that no matter what we do in Iraq, no matter what we do in Afghanistan, those nations are going to return to their natural state. Iraq is not even naturally a country. It's three countries, really, that were cobbled together post-World War I by Winston Churchill for really not a lot of reason. So it's natural that these things are falling apart. It's natural that they're going to continue to fight. The Sunni and Shia are not going to make peace between the two of them, between the two sects. So that's nothing we can stop, really. And I don't think we should waste any lives doing it. All right, Jed, now I'm going to bring in another side of this because we've had this conversation, but here comes what a lot of people will always say. And this is what I guess a lot of the military and the, pol the politicians will say. You know something, Jed, if we don't go in there right now, if we don't do something about it, if we just let them go back to their natural state, like you said, guess what? Their natural state means they're going to be run by terrorists, thugs, crooks, criminals. We're going to have to deal with it sooner or later. They will go after Israel. They will have new bases to go after America. And if we don't tamp this down right now, we're the problem more than anything else. Now, you know that all I'm doing is spitting out what many people will say back at you. They will say that we've got to go there and we've got to do the job because if we don't, it's going to come back and kill Americans sooner or later. Well, the fact of the matter is nobody defines the job, as you say. I mean, we're going to do the job. What are we going to do? We're going to sit there for another 10 years, 20 years, 100 years, and try to reduce them to democracy. That's not going to happen. We have not fought the ideological war. We have not defeated the enemy. And this is part of the issue that we face every single day when we, people talk about this. This is the neocon's dream. I'm no neocon. I don't believe we can democratize Islam. That's their business. If they want to reform Islam, and as General al-Sisi said in January, they desperately need a reformation. They need a revolution within their religion. That's not for us to bring about. We can't. We shouldn't even try. But the point of the matter is they have to fight their own fights. And when they come to the point where they're going to commit aggression against us, when they're going to threaten us, that's different. But we're not there yet. And we're going to have this situation go on you know, pretty much ad infinitum. We can be constantly at war forever or we can simply deal with this threat when it arises and then leave. That's the whole point. You break it, you bought it, nonsense. You break it, we'll come back and break it again every time you mess with us. But why then can't we? <laughs> it's, it really is. I love having this discussion because it always comes back to the fact that if we leave them to their own devices, the country will just completely disintegrate. If we go in and give them a new government, the country will completely disintegrate. There is absolutely no way of winning this whatsoever. So really, Jed, doesn't it make sense that whether we go in or not, we're going to be in a decades-long generational war either way? I don't think so. I think we have an obligation to fight this war differently. I think we have not done what we needed to do in so far as fighting the ideological war. A lot of people, a lot of experts, people a lot smarter than me, will tell you that it, religion, their religion. Islam is an ideology as much as it is a religion. And the reason why we succeeded, for example, in nation building in Japan and in Nazi Germany, post-Nazi Germany, 
was that we had a defeated enemy. Not only was their forces defeated, were their forces defeated, but their ideology was defeated. And Islamic ideology, the Islamists say they, they are inevitable, they're going to conquer, they're going to do everything they need to, to force their religion or force their society on us. We have to defeat that part of the ideology. I go back in 2002, I think, or no, I'm sorry, it was earlier than that, 2000, yeah, it was about 2002. General Peter Pace became chairman of the Joint Chiefs. And when he came into office, he issued a chairman's guidance which said, what you shoot is no more important than what you say and what you write. So we have to be very careful. We have to fight the ideological war. Pace was absolutely right. We have not done that. We've never tried that in respect to the Islamist ideology. And unless and until we do, we can go on with this fight forever. And we can't win it. Got about 30 seconds left. i got to sneak this in real quick. How long do you think this so-called uh, peace will last in the Ukraine? Oh, as long as it takes for uh, Vlad to reload. Uh, it'll be about another week, maybe, not longer than that. So really, every time we go to this guy and leave it in anybody else's hands, there's not going to be any peace here. You've got to go in and clean another one out. <laughs> well, that's something we really ought to think about much more seriously because it flanks NATO, and this is a direct threat to NATO. It's not in NATO yet. Ukraine is not something we need to go to war for. But if it goes into Estonia or Latvia or other NATO members, this is a direct challenge to the United States, and we're going to have to do something. Jed, always a pleasure to have you on the show. Straight talk. Thank you so much. We'll catch up with you again soon. Thanks very much. All right, take care. For a time, it was raging across the daily headlines at politicians screaming at each other. Now it's a whimper, maybe with good reason. We'll tell you what it is when we return.